All right, this evening we're continuing our study in uh, spiritual warfare, and uh, as soon as I find it, it's here, it's here somewhere. <laughs> Hang on, now I've got to figure out what, I've got so much stuff on my iPad now, it's crazy. Let's see, there it is, soldier up. Matthew 28 is where you can start, if you're turning your Bible there or navigating. And probably should have a word of prayer before we begin, how's that? Father, thanks for our evening, and as we uh, look at your word, Lord, we're excited about it because uh, you're speaking to us through it. Gosh, thank you so much, Lord, for loving us enough to communicate with us from heaven and to show us your love, Lord, through Jesus Christ. I pray that we would understand that as we look to Jesus and look at Jesus, we're seeing God in the flesh. Everything we need to know about God is right there in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. And so tonight, Lord, all of us, I'm sure, have one or two or more wrong notions about you, uh, a wrong understanding, a wrong perspective. I pray that that would be adjusted, Lord, and that we would know only your grace and mercy and forgiveness, your acceptance and the assurance of our salvation. Or, Lord, if we're not saved, if there's a person or two here that doesn't know you, that the conviction of your spirit as you show them the beautiful life that you lived and gave for them. And we thank you in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. You know the phrase, the best offense is a good defense. Of course, then they also say the best defense is a good offense, so I'm not sure which is true. Now, so far, we've talked about our part in spiritual warfare as mostly mounting a good defense, taking a stand, resisting the enemy, things like that. Truth is, we are always to be on the offensive, but maybe not the way you think. Our offensive strategy isn't to go about demon hunting and conducting exorcisms. As we saw last time we were together on this topic, it doesn't involve things like spiritual mapping or identifying territorial spirits or anything like that. Our great spiritual offensive is simply but powerfully the sharing of the gospel in a world ruled by Satan. Is it not by receiving the gospel that a person is set free from sin, transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Nothing seems more on offense than to share Christ and see those who are held captive set free. Along those lines, I'd like to string together three passages tonight. We'll start in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It's what we call the Great Commission. It is our marching orders as soldiers of the cross. Then we'll go to Matthew 12, 26 through 29, which describes Jesus as binding Satan in order to plunder his possessions. And then in Luke 10, 18 through 20, we'll see Jesus' assessment of the success of 70 soldiers he sent out to preach the gospel. And so let's start with the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And uh, Matthew ends by saying, Amen. Now, we aren't going to spend too much time on these verses themselves. There are two takeaways we always need to be reminded of when we think about the Great Commission. First of all, go, that word is really as you are going. It's not describing a missions trip you go on, nothing wrong with those, but rather your life as a mission to share Jesus as you are going through. And so the Lord says, hey, when you're going through your life, as you're going out in the world, this is what I want you to be doing. The Lord, secondly, will be with you by His indwelling Spirit and, of course, by the baptism of the Spirit to empower you as you're going. And so the Lord says, I want you to go, and everywhere you go and as you're going, know that you have the power of my Holy Spirit to make disciples of all men. Now, the single point I want to make tonight from these verses is that we would start thinking of the Great Commission as an offensive battle strategy. And it might be better to call it the great mission. Left in enemy territory, we're to go through it sharing the good news about Jesus as we encounter people who are in Satan's kingdom of darkness being held captive by him. That's a pretty accurate description of the world in which we live. The offensive against Satan continues 
after a person is set free because we're told to make disciples of the converts, and in a nutshell, it means we're to build them up so they too go about sharing the gospel. And so this is an offensive strategy uh, while we are left here, as it were, behind enemy lines. The gates of hell have not and they cannot prevail against this offensive. Everyone we share Jesus with isn't saved, but many are, and the gospel marches on right to the coming of Jesus to resurrect and rapture the church. Now, of course, others will be saved after that during the Great Tribulation as well, but uh, we're talking about the church age right now. A few Sundays ago, I think I mentioned that um, there's a, a popular saying to encourage people to serve the Lord. They say that the church is always one generation away from extinction. And the idea is that if you don't share Christ, uh, then no one's going to hear the gospel and the gospel's going to fail and everything that Jesus did is going to fail. Now, of course, that's impossible um, because Jesus said the gates of hell could not prevail against the church. It, it's not to excuse us to say that we shouldn't share the gospel or that, uh, you know, all that, but we just want to be honest with people. And the, the real truth is if you don't share, if you don't live a life for the Lord, then the Lord will raise somebody else up and empower them to do it. Uh, the, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. It is a successful uh, endeavor. It is the most successful spiritual offensive in the history of the world, obviously. Uh, because it, 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 and all the more so when you realize that it's carried out in weakness, with meekness, uh, with very little resources or strength. Church is almost always the strongest when it's the weakest, uh, as it were. Uh, and so, um, you know, be motivated to share the gospel, but not because you think uh, you're, you know, it, the whole weight of it is on your back. It's not. It's something that we get to do, and it's a privilege. I like to reference D-Day when discussing spiritual warfare. You've heard me do this over the last few months. Um, I picked it up from some of the writers that I'm reading, and it's, it's a good illustration. And I've said in the past, the successful invasion of Normandy by the Allied forces, it effectively ended World War II. There were significant casualties after D-Day. The war went on for almost another year. But the enemy was routed, he was defeated, and our victory was assured. It's similar to our spiritual warfare in that Satan and his minions were defeated by Jesus, but they continue to fight on, and they will fight on until the second coming of the Lord. Now, the thing about D-Day, and I don't claim to be a historian, and so afterwards, those of you who know more about this can set me straight, so the next time I use this illustration, it makes more sense. But uh, the thing about D-Day that I think I understand is that we had to take five beaches or the whole thing was going to fail. I mean, there were five beaches involved, uh, at least, that I know of, and everybody had an assignment, and, and those beaches were all critical, and we had to take those beaches in order to form a beachhead to press on uh, into Europe. It was from those beachheads that the Allied forces were sent out to cement the victory. Jesus invaded the earth, as it were, and He took the beaches for us. A pivotal battle took place in the wilderness where Jesus was tempted by the devil for a period of 40 days. We looked at it in our studies in Matthew, but you're familiar enough with it. It was like champion warfare in which each side sent out its strongest soldier, its champion, in a winner-take-all match. It was like a David and Goliath situation uh, in one sense, in the sense that David said, I'll be Israel's champion and Goliath obviously was the Philistine champion, but you see this sometimes, you know, in movies, and maybe it's even true in history, I don't know, but they say, hey, you know, we don't want to fight, how about this guy? You know, this guy's a big bruiser, he's going to fight for us, we've got our champion, you've got your champion, whoever wins, wins, and we'll acquiesce to that, and we'll just go with that. Uh, and so this is like one-on-one -on -one champion warfare, and Jesus absolutely soundly defeated Satan. You see the extent of his victory later in a literal beach landing at Gadara. As recorded in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was approached by a demon-possessed man. In a conversation with the man, Jesus learned he was possessed, he said, by a legion of demons. He said, my name is Legion, indicating that he was filled with demons. Oh, that's a lot of demons. I don't know how they fit. You know, people are always trying to figure out how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. A better question is how many demons can live inside somebody because a Roman legion, I think, is a thousand men. 
And so this, this guy was messed up. He was in a bad way. Jesus cast out the demons. They entered a herd of swine and rushed headlong over a cliff into the sea. And so we would say, literally even, Jesus took that beach. He established a beachhead for us from which we venture out with the gospel on offense. The Lord described his victory over the devil by telling a quick parable, parable of the strong man. If you want to go over to Matthew 12 now, verse 26, it'll be on the screen. We looked at this on Sunday morning, but we're looking at it a little bit differently tonight. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so you remember the context here. The religious leaders were astonished at Jesus' authority over Satan and demons. They didn't want to give him any respect. They didn't want to let on that, that they thought this was genuine. And so they attributed Jesus' power over the devil to his being in league with the devil. Now, that's just stupid. I, I mean, it, it, for, whether you're smart or whether you're not so smart, that's just stupid. But, you know, it's interesting. When you reject the truth of the gospel, any lie will do no matter how stupid. And, you know, some of the things when you see these uh, uh, experts and uh, educated men and intellectuals and guys with multiple PhDs and all that, when they start talking about um, the universe and the cosmos and, you know, and they come against God and all of that, they just say the stupidest things. I mean, they, they say things that are really stupid. I knew something was going on, but I'm loud enough anyway, so I just ignored it. Um, they just say things that are stupid. Uh, evolution is stupid. Uh, it, it really is. Uh, you know, just to think, I don't want to get into it, but, you know, so all of these things. So these guys said, well, well, you know, he's definitely casting out demons. He just cast out a thousand demons, and then they went, I'm pretty sure they were demons because the pigs you know, got involved, and so I mean, it was a very visual kind of a thing. Maybe he is the devil, you know, and, and Jesus, I mean, Jesus is being nice, but he could have just said, hey, you guys are stupid, uh, but he said it in a more... Jesus kind of way. You know, what would Jesus say? I know what I would say, but... Now, so Jesus pointed out why it was a false accusation when he said in verse 29, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he'll plunder his house. And so Jesus pictured the world as Satan's house and Satan as a strong man guarding his house. The devil's goods are a reference to people held captive by him. Not just demon-possessed people, but everyone who is not saved is taken captive by the devil to do his will. By default, if you're not saved, you're lost and you'll perish eternally, and so you're, you're in the kingdom of darkness. You may not know it, but you are. Now, scholars debate when exactly Jesus bound Satan, what he's actually talking about here. Best guess... When he defeated the devil in the wilderness, it put everyone on notice that Jesus was and would be victorious. From that moment forward, the devil was on the run whenever Jesus was around. In that wilderness temptation, we read in the Gospels that the devil left him for a time. He kept coming back and tempting him and, or, and attacking him and assailing him again and again. But, but there was no moment of, uh, you know, it wasn't a seesaw battle. It wasn't that Jesus won the wilderness temptation and then he went out and, and there was a legion of demons that he couldn't cast out and so he had to go and strengthen up and then come back out and then, you know, it, wasn't, it didn't go back and forth at all. Jesus came and he was filled with the Spirit and baptized with the Spirit and led out into the wilderness. He took on the devil one-to-one, -one, uh, weary, tired, fasting for 40 days using only the weapon of the Word of God, and from that moment on, the devil was on the run. And, and, and Jesus hasn't given up the victory since then. He went about setting free captives. He exercised demons. He set men free from all physical ailments and disabilities, many of them caused by demons. And so everywhere Jesus went, he established that he had defeated the devil. One way to characterize Jesus' entire three and a half years of ministry was that of a plunderer who went about setting free those 
previously held bound. Jesus sent out His followers to do what He had been doing. In one such mission, He sent out 70 disciples. Upon their return, they said to the Lord, this is from Luke 10, verse 17, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in Your name. To which the Lord responded, verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. This is an interesting scripture. It's unlikely that Jesus was referring to Satan's original fall when he sinned in the past and led a third of the angels with him. The context here is a fall that is the result of his having been defeated by Jesus. Is it his future fall at the return of the Lord? Probably not, because the Lord was describing something that connects to the success of the 70 in their mission. I think Jesus was describing his victory over Satan in the wilderness as a precursor of his final victory over him at the cross. The devil came at Jesus with his best shot. Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. Now, this isn't the same idiom in our language, but we would say the devil went down in flames, and we would understand it to mean, you know, we wouldn't be looking at some cosmic event in the past, or we would just understand that to be, hey, the devil's been defeated. And, and that certainly took place in the wilderness. And so, so you know, he's not, not talking about the original fall of Satan because what would, that wouldn't mean anything to encourage the disciples. That has nothing to do with them having the, an authority over him. And it's not his future fall. And so just a point of, of teaching that he's probably talking about his uh, victory over the devil while he was on the earth. The point we can make from that is that because Jesus took the beach... We have authority on earth to battle the devil and his demons in our mission of going with the gospel. And as is usual in our spiritual warfare, we're to not concentrate on them being subject to us, but on our salvation and on sharing it with other captives. And so the the disciples were starting to be into some of this Pentecostal demon chasing stuff where they said, man, we went out and and we defeated the devil. We said, devil, we're kicking you in the face, you know, that kind of stuff. You've seen that on TV if you've ever watched televangelists, you know. Tell the devil you're going to get him. My advice to you is not to talk to the devil at all. But uh, anyway, uh, and so these guys were, you know, I'm exaggerating. They're getting a little bit, you know, in too much. And Jesus said, hey, the devil, you know, he's been defeated. Uh, He's he's gone down in flames, uh, but you need to rejoice in salvation in your salvation and in the sharing of your salvation. That's where I want you to focus. Our focus is not going to be on the demonic realm. Daniel, I can't wait till we get to Daniel. I don't know when we'll start doing that, but I can't wait till we get to Daniel because Daniel's praying and praying and praying, and finally Gabriel comes and he says, man, I could have been here three weeks ago, but a territorial spirit, the prince of Persia, and we were wrestling, and Michael had to come and help me, and Daniel said, basically, in his attitude, so what? What is that to me? I'm just going to keep praying like I was praying, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to rally everybody. Did you get the guy's name so that we could take Persia by storm? No, Daniel just said, hey, that's something something for the Lord to deal with. And so let the Lord deal with that, and and, uh, I love Daniel. Daniel is such a great example in so many areas, Um, uh, just a truly great guy. And so we're to concentrate on salvation. Now, I keep saying we when clearly this uh, passage here about the 70 was spoken to them, but it's also spoken to every disciple in the last chapel, uh, chap, <laughs> chapter of Mark's gospel. Mark 16, beginning in verse 15, I'll just read it to you. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is Mark's version of the great mission. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, a few quick observations before we put these verses in our context tonight. First of all, these signs did accompany the early disciples in the book of Acts. They are present throughout church history from time to time. And they happen today. They don't need to happen in every instance in order for this to be true. 
I mean, how many, how many, uh, how many of these signs have to happen in order for, for us to say that there is a fulfillment of this Scripture? New tongues may be a reference to the supernatural gift of being able to speak in a language you've never learned in order to preach the gospel. If you're here for our series on the Holy Spirit, we made a distinction between the gift of speaking in unknown tongues and the gift of languages. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples spoke in known foreign languages they had never learned, and everybody heard them in their own language. And I've read of this happening in church history from time to time, uh, where someone all of a sudden started speaking, and, and it turned out to be a language that, uh, of a, a tribe or a group of people, or they just spontaneously had a language that they'd never learned before. As to deadly serpents, the sense of the words here, I'm told, are if you're compelled to pick up serpents or if you're compelled to drink poison, then God is more than able to protect you. Great example of this is Paul the Apostle. After his shipwreck, he's gathering little sticks, you know, for the fire, and a, a serpent comes out and a deadly snake comes out and attaches itself to him, and he shakes it off, and the natives are all like waiting for him to puff up and vomit and die because it was one of those. It must have been Australia because that's where all those things are. Do you ever watch any specials on Australia? Well, I was taking a shower and a fly the size of a pinhead bit me and 10 seconds later I was dead, you know, but they, I mean, it, they have stuff over there. You talk about it being a penal colony. It's, it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's like a dinosaur land over there. Just, I don't recommend it. But uh, anyway, uh, and so the idea, you know, I mean, this could, you know, again, how many people, it doesn't mean that anybody that's ever bit by a snake who's a Christian, I mean, you want to clear out a den of black widows, you know, don't, don't be stupid about it. Don't get into snake handling or all that. That's not what it's talking about. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. God still gives gifts of healings to his body of believers on the earth. He's sovereign as to who and how and when he heals. Whatever he does, he does it to bring glory to his name. And so... All of these things still happen. Uh, you know, they, they, they maybe don't happen as often or to, to our liking, but talked a little bit about that this past Sunday, did we not? The characteristic of the age in which we live is not healing that proves that Jesus is the Messiah. It is suffering that proves that Jesus is our Savior because our light affliction is but for a moment working for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. And, and people look at us and they think, how can you go on in this situation with joy and peace that passes all understanding and, and you point them to Jesus? And so a very different age in which we live. Going with the gospel is spiritual warfare. It is us on the offensive setting free captives because the strong man is bound. Had the Jews received the Lord, he would have established the kingdom. Satan would have literally been bound and thrown into the abyss. They didn't. He wasn't. And so he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil is like the enemy axis forces who fought on after D-Day. Our mission, go with the gospel. Not everyone is saved, but neither was everyone saved when Jesus was on the earth. We just go, and as we're going in the power of the Spirit, we're to share the Lord. Amen. Amen.